All right. I'll step over here. All right, talking about Brazil, me and my wife, uh, definitely the much better looking one there, uh, my better half. We are heading to Brazil. Now, to give you an idea about Brazil, it's developing out of a third world country. And if you were to fly over, this is their largest city, Sao Paulo, um, you would to see how they're advancing. Now, Brazil itself is a large country. It's the fifth largest in the world, fifth largest by population. And when you look at what Brazil is doing right now, they're trying to get out of that poverty. Um, they have a lot of rich, a lot of very, very poor people. Um, but you see they get the modern headaches along with the modern conveniences. And so that's Brazil right now. And you know, like the Bible says, woe be to them that build house to house. Why is that? Well, because man, when they get together without the purpose of seeking God, it ends up being sin. And so that's what's taking place there. There's a lot of that. There's a lot of, if you read about Brazil, there's a lot of violence, a lot of crime, um, as they're getting more dense in their population. Now, for us, that's an opening. Right now, Brazil has the third highest rate of incarceration as far as people in prison. There's over 700,000 people in prison in Brazil. And so that's been a ministry I've been working on for the past 15 years. My dad got me started in that. As you heard, um, Dr. Uckman was my father. I had the, the great blessing to be able to travel around with him and do prison work. And so hopefully we'll be able to do some of that in Brazil as well. Now, when you look at Brazil, the country itself, it's about the size of the continental United States. So this area here, if I were to point this out to you, this is called the Amazon. And I know you're thinking of that package you ordered and you're waiting on in the mail. This, this is a different Amazon. This is a rainforest. There's, there's water, humidity, a lot of heat. So what happens is a lot of people do not want to live there. And so they move out towards the coast. Most people there in Brazil live in this area. Uh, this is Sao Paulo here, 20 million people. Rio de Janeiro is there, about 12 million. We're going to be in a town up here called Poço Alegre. We're also going to be studying under a veteran missionary until we get the language and the culture down. And then head out and start our own work from there as the Lord leads. Now, this you've seen before. You've seen poverty, and you've seen it all over the place in the world. And, and as an American, I believe what this does for us is we look at that and almost have a guilt about that, because many of us have never lived like that. We've never seen that. We've never lived in poverty. And we think, why is it that I should have it so good and they don't? Well, I'll give you some reasons here in a little bit, but when you look at this, these are the places called favelas in Brazil. And a lot of the poor people from the farms move into these areas. And they start living there house to house. There's really many times no running water. There's no sewer system. There's no uh, police stations there. There's no hospitals there. Um, not really any structure set up there. So you can see it's a very chaotic place. Very uh, place full of violence and crime. A lot of sin there. When you look at that place... It's kind of an untouchable area. And what happens is the ones that, that suffer the most in those areas are the children, really. They get raised in an environment. Many times their parents forsake them and leave them off. Many of them abandon them. Many of them neglect them from the parents being connected to drugs. Um, there's a lot of gangs that run these favelas. So what happens is these kids begin to live on the street. And this is one of the worst social problems that Brazil has. When you look at the street kids, there's about, uh, on a conservative number, there's about 8 million kids that live on the street. So a very, very large number. And they live with what they own on their back. That's all they have. And we got to see this very briefly, our last uh, trip there to Brazil. And for me, that burdened me. Because I wasn't brought up like that. I never went to bed hungry. I never had to sleep out underneath the stars unless we were having fun, going camping, you know. And the Lord burdened me about trying to reach those kids because the worst state is not this life here. They're physical poverty. It's the spiritual poverty. 
The Bible tells you in John that the thief cometh to steal and to kill and to destroy. But thank God Jesus Christ came to give life and to give it more abundantly. That's what they need to hear. And that's what we hope to bring to those kids. Now, talking about beggars, talking about poverty, we think of those kids as the worst beggars. Some of those kids start off at five years old out on the street, some younger. And their life expectancy goes to about 14 years. And you say, that's very tragic. But you know what? 14 years suffering is not a big deal compared to eternity suffering. That's what these people face. They come as beggars thinking they're coming before God. They come to a church. And that church tells them, well, you do this, you do that, and God may find favor on you, and you might get to heaven. And they come begging for hope and for help. And they leave away just as empty as they came. That's the, the worst condition Brazil has is that spiritual poverty. This is the layout of the religions you have there. Most of it's Roman Catholic. Um, Protestantism, most of that is Pentecostal. So they're just as lost as they were in the, the Catholic Church, except for they have a little bit more exciting service. That's about it. So when you consider that, for the most part, those people are deceived. And you say, well, what about the Catholic Church? How bad is it? Well, in Brazil, they have this. Uh, it's a special thing they promote there. In some of the cathedrals, they have these are called votives. And a votive in the Roman Catholic Church in Brazil, you come with an ailment. You have a bad back. That's a backbone there. Bad hand, bad heart. Um, headaches, things like that. There's heads down here, wax heads, wax legs. What they do is they teach those people, you come, whatever ailment or your family's ailment, you purchase that body part. And you leave it with the priest. And that priest prays over that and you're supposed to get healed if you have enough faith. Well, guess what happens if you don't get healed? Well, you don't have enough faith, so what do you need to do? Come back and bring more money. So the Brazilians are learning what it's about. It's not about God being gracious. It's not about God wanting to help them. It's about a religion getting more and more power and building their kingdom on this earth. And this you see all over Brazil. Massive cathedrals while the people live in poverty. So this man, I visited him in 2002 and really just wanted to visit a mission field. The Lord had laid on my heart about being a missionary. Visited about seven of his nine churches that he started. And prayed that the Lord would allow me to see somebody saved if he'd like me to come back on an official survey trip. Well, thankfully, this young man here, we were meeting in a utility shed. He heard the singing and the piano music from the street. Came in out off the street. He was trying to find a ride with someone to the next town. Instead of finding his way to the next town, he found his way to heaven. And he got saved. So the Lord answered that prayer. In that time, the Lord delayed me going. And like I started off telling you with it, it's all about God's timing. He delayed me. Obviously, he wanted me to stay there in Pensacola to help my dad. Dr. Upman was our pastor in the church. And I stayed there for the last, you know, 16, 17 years helping him and whatever, whatever ministry. And also doing ministries myself with my wife. Um, we got to go on a trip again uh, down to Brazil in 2016. Got to do some uh, chalk work and preaching there. Got to see some results from that. This young lady here, Andrelli, she's one of the church members' nieces. She came out that first night and got saved. Along with these two young church boys here, Paulo and Gabriel, they got saved the first night we were there. Um, we had a special meeting on a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And that Friday night, this man, his name is Joe, he came out that first night and got saved. And then the last night we were there, this lady next to my wife, her name's Bruna. She was one of the co-workers. She came out and got saved. Now, I show you those things to show you really those Brazilian people did the work there. They got those lost people in church. They got their, their, friend, their family and their friends and their co-workers and had a burden to get them into church. And so the Lord blessed that and allowed us to get to see those people get saved. And even more of a blessing, we didn't just try to get the lost people in church we went to where they were held up scripture signs did some uh, public open air preaching and thankfully in brazil they haven't learned that street preaching doesn't work so this man right here his name's umberto 
he heard the preaching from the park across the street, and he came across there and wanted to find out more and got saved there on the street corner. Uh, along with another lady later on, her name's Sandra, she got saved later that day as well. Now, one thing I show you that is because I am, I am excited because I know at least that part is the will of God. God's not willing that any should perish. And I had a small part in, in seeing seven souls have their eternity change from living in hell to going to heaven. Now, that's what I would like to see. I'd like to see more of that. And you say, well, that's, that's great. You know, you're going to Brazil. Why is there a need for more missionaries in Brazil? Just like you were told today, around the world, there's over seven uh, and a half billion people. In Brazil itself, you say you've heard of missionaries down to Brazil. Well, even with a few, even those seven souls we got to see get saved, that's nothing compared to how many people are in need of salvation down there. Over 184 million people. So you say, why is it there's a need? Well, the number right there should tell you. But we can't leave it just with that. We have to go to an authority higher than that. The Lord Himself said, the harvest is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray ye, the Lord of the harvest, that He'll send forth labors into His harvest. He gave us a command to pray that these people get the opportunity to hear what you got to hear already. And so that's our desire. That's what we ask you guys to do as well, to pray for us. We're the Huggins. Um, I don't know if you understand, but as far as us, that name here, Huggins, usually in America, hug is a friendly thing. So I guess we have a friendly last name. Um, but you can, you can see my wife about the hugs. I've already been told I don't give good hugs. So we'll leave it at that. But if you could just remember us, the Huggins, pray for us. Uh, we, would, we would definitely need that. And we thank you guys for being very hospitable to us, having us here and treating us very well. We thank you for that and uh, hope that's a blessing. I'll go ahead and give you guys a head start while we get this set up. Um, if you could, go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 5. I don't know if we can get that board. Yes, sir. And thinking about the blessing of hearing the gospel, I think about that. Um, like you guys already know, I heard the gospel at a, a very young age. And that was a great blessing to me. Obviously, I don't have the baggage that probably so many of you guys have. Um, could I get a music stand or something over here? Might just wait till we get this. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Actually, I don't know how well this is going to work. Okay, that'll work. All right, but if you're in Matthew chapter 5, I'll go ahead and let you know a little bit about uh, me getting saved as a young boy. That was a great blessing to me. Um, when you consider that, somebody had to take the time out. Somebody had to put forth effort to make sure the gospel was going to be presented to someone. 
And I'm sure it wasn't, it wasn't one of those dramatic things in uh, life where you didn't realize, I'm sure the preacher didn't realize everything that was involved. Um, but you know what? If we were to go off of our feeling, if we were to go off of how we feel about serving the Lord, really none of us would be doing anything for God. Because you don't feel like serving the Lord all the time. And so when you consider that, when you consider that, you know what, it's not about your feeling. It's not about, do you feel like doing something for God? It's about the command He gave. And I want you to notice here in, in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, you notice in this passage where Jesus Christ obviously is doctrinally not necessarily to the church, but we want to take a spiritual application. And we want to take this spiritual application and give it to you because, you know what, there's a lot of the Bible. There's a lot of the Bible that's not directly written to you, doctrinally. But you can get a lot of very good stuff out of it. And this is one of those passages in Matthew chapter 5. And you notice this, look down in verse 14. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14. Jesus Christ says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good work and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now you consider that. Consider that passage, let your light so shine. Now let's go ahead and before we get started, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and gather around your word. Lord, thank you that we have the message from heaven that we can hold in our hand. Lord, I pray you'd help us to take heed to that. Help us to realize the importance of your word here today. I pray you'd already go before us and prepare our hearts to hear your word. Pray you'd wash us in your blood. Cleanse up anything, Lord, that would hinder your truth and your glory from being brought here today. We thank you for what you've done for us already. Pray, Lord, uh, it was already prayed, Lord, we're looking forward to you coming back. And when you do come back, if we're here, help us to be working for you. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Now, Jesus Christ says there in the passage, He says, ye are the light of the world. Ye are the light of the world. Now, I can't uh, really emphasize that enough because Jesus Christ is talking about, He's talking about your participation or your position that's intended. Jesus Christ, got a, He has a position that He intends for you to be at. And where is that position? Well, He says, ye are the light. Ye are the light where? Not in church, but ye are the light of the world. How, how easy is it to be a shining and glorious and magnificent Christian here? What about out in the world? He says, you're a light in the world. Now, that's participation He has intended for you in a certain place. He's got a place for you. Now, you say, well, I don't like my position. Well, that's not up to you. Your position's not up to you. The Lord knows exactly where you need to be. He knows exactly where you should fit in your Christian life, and only He knows that. And when you consider that, your position, it may not be a glorious position. It may not be a glamorous position. You know what? If you take that position, you know what you're going to get? You're going to get some opposition, just like Jesus Christ did. You notice in Jesus Christ and His ministry, you know what happened to Him? People didn't like His position. And who's the ones that didn't like it? The most religious people. They couldn't stand it. In fact, talking about this, you know a, a preacher in America, his name was D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was one of those preachers, he just really didn't have a high education, but God used him. God used that man. And D.L. Moody would get up and he'd preach. He'd preach anywhere he had an opportunity, whether it was in the pulpit or outside of the pulpit, wherever it was, he would preach. And D.L. Moody got up and was preaching away, and one lady came up to Moody after the service and said, Mr. Moody, I, I really don't like the way you're presenting the gospel to the people. And Moody says, well, you know what, as you, as you mentioned that, you know what, I really don't like the way I have to do it either. Let me ask you a question. How are you doing it? And she says, well, I, I don't do it at all. And you know what Moody said? Moody says, I like the way I'm doing it better than the way you're not doing it. And you know what? The question is today is not how do you think you should do it, but what are you doing? Are you a light in this world? 
Are you shining for the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you just thinking up better ways to do it? That's what we're talking about, a position. He has intended for you. Ye are, ye are the light of this world. That's what He wants from you, to be a light. Now, that position may not be too glamorous. You may not have thousands of followers. You know what? It's not about the following. When you consider that, it's not about how many people you can get to follow you. When you, when you stop and consider that, the Lord's given you to, uh, a command to be a light. And He's given you a command to be a light in this world. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, Jesus Christ preached the greatest truth that's ever been preached on this earth. How many people did He end up following Him? All men forsook Him and fled. He was there by Himself, having to give a message Himself at His own crucifixion. You know what? It's not about the following. It's about your position God put you in whether anybody follows you or not. That's where He wants you. Well, you say, well, it's not too glamorous. I don't like what's going on. Well, Bob Jones Sr. had a good analogy of that. He used to talk about that. He says, you know what? I have a light in my house. I have a light in my house. And this, I, a lot of people ask me, you know, about my house. And I tell them, well, the most important, the greatest light in my house, you know what it is? And they all in wonder, what, what's the greatest light in his house? Because they come over for dinners and there's this great big chandelier as you enter in the foyer of his house. Big, huge chandelier. And they think, well, that's got to be the most important light. It's the biggest. It's the shiniest. And he says, that's not the most important light in my house. It actually takes the most work. All the cleaning, all the getting the tarnish off of it, all this stuff, changing all the light bulbs. It's just a lot of work. They say, what's the most important light? He takes him back to the hallway and he points out to a little light that's plugged into the hallway there on the, the side of the wall. Just a tiny little night light. That's the most important light in my house because I get up at night. It keeps me from stumbling and breaking my neck trying to get a glass of water or go to the bathroom at night. You say, well, I want to be like that big chandelier. Everybody comes in the room, I want them to see me. How important I am, how big I am, how impressive I am. And the Lord's saying, no, I just want you to be a little light to keep somebody from stumbling. Where are you at, Christian? Are you in the position God intended you to be? A light in this world. Not so you can shine on yourself, but you, so you can give light for them that walk in darkness. That's what he's talking about there. Ye are, ye are the light of the world. Ye are the light of the world. Now that's the position he had intended. You think about that position. D.L. Moody tells another story about that. He said, I was uh, doing some work in near Cleveland, Cleveland, Ohio, and I saw in the newspaper where there was a, a bad storm. And in that storm, there was a chaotic wreck there. All the boats, there was all kinds of boats that got destroyed in that, that storm. And he wondered what had happened. He read the newspaper, and what took place was there was a lighthouse keeper. And this lighthouse keeper... He was tending the light until one day he realized, you know what? Everybody else is having a good time this weekend and they're out, you know, enjoying their family. I think I can just skip out one day. And so he did. He skipped out and he stopped tending that light just for that day and didn't think much of it and got out there and left his post there at the lighthouse. And you know what happened that evening? He thought, well, I'm a, I'm a lower light. I'm just a light here. Nobody's really paying attention to me. I'm not that important, you know. I'm, I'm a lower light. And he looks up on the hill, and there's a big lighthouse up on the hill. He says, as long as that light's burning, I can leave my post. So he did. He left his post and went out and had a good time with his family, came back that next morning, looked out all up and down the, the shoreline there and saw boats smashed up and down the harbors there. What had happened was he was one of those lower lighthouses that guided those ships into the harbor. And you know what? He decided other things were important. And Moody read that story in the newspaper. And he came back and he preached the message on that. And he says, let the lower lights be burning. And Philip Bliss actually turned that into the song we sing today. Let the lower lights be burning. You know what the Lord needs? He doesn't need a lot of great lighthouses in this world. He needs just a bunch of lower lights to keep burning where you're at, at your job, around your family, around your friends. That's what he needs. The lower lights be burning. How is it going with you, Christian? Are those lower lights burning or have you decided there are more important things that you could do? That's the position 
That's the position He had intended for you. You think about that. Think about the position God has intended for you. Now, I know nobody walked in this building. Nobody walked in this building and they started looking around the building and saying, you know what? This is such an impressive place. Now, I think the most impressive thing about that is that exit sign back there. Or that exit sign up here. And you're saying, man, I just can't wait to come back to church to see those nice exit signs. You know what? I know you didn't do that. Nobody thought anything about those exit signs here today until I said something. You say, why is it? Because nobody cares because there's no emergency. What would happen if this room was filled with smoke? And you couldn't see out those windows and you couldn't see anything. You know what you'd be looking for? That exit sign. You know what happens in this lost world? They start to realize their life is in shambles, it's in disaster. And you know what they're looking for? Just a little exit sign stuck on the wall where it needs to be. And you know what? How many times are they missing that light? God's got a position He intended for you to be. Are you being a light in this world where you need to be? That's what he's asking you. Ye are, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Now also look back to that passage you notice there. He's not only got a position intended, he's got some purpose that gets neglected. Look back to verse 15. Verse 15 of Matthew chapter 5. He says, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. Put it under a bushel. What is that bushel? Well, you know what the bushel doesn't do? The bushel doesn't stop the light from burning. All it does is put the light to where it can't go through. It covers. It covers that light. So you know what so many Christians do? Is they allow that light to be covered. They allow that light to be covered up by something. Well, what is it? Well, it could be be your self-ambition. It could be your pride. And it could be just very likely your sin that covers that up. What was a bushel? I used to think a bushel when I was a kid was a little bush. But it's actually about an eight-gallon device that, that used for measuring seed. Big thing. They would cover that up. And you know what happens? So many times is that light is put in your life, and God wants to have that light shine through you. And you know what you do? You allow something to cover. You allow something to cover that light. You say, what is that? Well, that's, that may be your sin. That may be your sin. You let your sin get in the way. And you don't have a good testimony. You don't have a good light that shines through you because all people see in your life is the covering, your sin. And so you know what? That's not what you're to have. When we were, I was a young boy, I had a guy in the church, he used to take us out camping. And we loved to go camping. And he'd take us out camping. We went to a place called Fort Pickens there in Pensacola. And this place called Fort Pickens, it was on a, a federal piece of land and we kind of had to sneak into the fort a little bit and go around the gate. And he told us, he says, boys, since we've sneaked in, there's a light over there at the Navy base. And when that light comes around, it's a big lighthouse. When that light shines on you, if those people see us over there, they'll send over the Navy and they'll come throw us in federal prison. We were, we were scared to death. So we'd see that light swinging around like that off in the distance. We'd jump off the seawall we were running on. We'd dive off into the dirt. And we'd jump into the water. We'd try to get away from that as much as possible. We didn't want that light to hit us. You say, why was it? Well, we were, we were not doing what we were supposed to be doing. We felt like we were breaking the law. You know, so many people run from that light and hide from that light. So many people don't want that light to shine in their own life. So what do they do? They cover it so nobody can see that's what you don't want to happen that's the purpose of the light that gets neglected look also to Luke Luke chapter 11 Luke chapter 11 not only is that purpose get neglected but you end up with you end up with a purpose getting neglected as far as the covering but you also have it being concealed being concealed and you find this here in Luke chapter 11 you notice this look in verse 33 he says no man when he hath lighted a candle putteth it in a secret place putteth it in a secret place you know what he's mentioning there is when you have that candle lit you know what you want to do you want that candle to light up everything you can see you want that candle to be a light So you can see. 
And you know what you don't do with that candle? You don't light that candle and put it in a secret place. You don't bring it away from where it should be. Do you know what that message is about? That message is about like old, uh, like old Jonah. What, did, what was Jonah? Jonah was a light. Jonah was a light in this world. And you know what God said? God says, I want you to go shine your light. Where do, you, where do you want it shine? Well, I want you to go shine in Nineveh. Jonah says, well, I don't want to go to Nineveh. Those people are just wicked. They're just evil. They don't even know the right hand from the left. And you know what the Lord says? He said, no, I want you to go preach there. Jonah had better ideas. So what did Jonah do? Well, he brought that light to a secret place. He brought that light out of where it was supposed to be. And you know what? He thought that would be okay. You know what happened to the story of Jonah. He ends up getting swallowed by a whale. But that story of Jonah teaches us something. That story of Jonah teaches us something about that. That secret place. You can take that light and you can take that light to a secret place. You know, so many people, especially in this country, they have the light in them. They have the light that Jesus Christ gave to them inside of them. And you know what? Instead of shining it to this old world, you know what they do? They bring that light and take it to a secret place. You know what they let happen? They let their desires and feelings direct them. And you know what? That light doesn't end up shining where it's supposed to be shining. It ends up being in a secret place. You say, well, how is that? Well, you let your job direct where you're going to be at. Even though there's no church there, even though there's no... No place that you can get together with other believers. You let your job direct where you're going. Maybe your career. Maybe it's something like that. And you know what? That's a secret place. You take that light instead of where God intended it for it to be. Well, you think about that. Uh, also look to Luke chapter 11, verse 33. Not only is it a secret place, he mentions the bushel there, but look to Luke chapter 8. Look to Luke chapter 8. And you notice it's not just the secret place that that light goes to. But he also has there in Luke chapter 8, look down in verse 16. He says, No man when he lighteth a candle, covereth it with a vessel. Covereth it with a vessel. You know what you shouldn't do is try to contain, try to cover that light with a vessel. You know what that's a picture of? That's a picture of your flesh. So many Christians, they, they stand up and say, well, I want to serve the Lord. I want, to, I want to please the Lord and do something for Him. But you know what it ends up being? It ends up being all in the flesh. It ends up being all about yourself. And you know what? That's serving yourself. That's serving your flesh. I learned that when I was a young Christian. We were, we were in Bible school and we were learning all kinds of stuff, you know, and learning all these new doctrines. And it was, man, it was exciting. I was enjoying what we were doing. And learning all this stuff about the Bible, and me and this, this buddy at work, we had about five or six guys there from PBI, and we're working there at the job, and we started arguing about some of the stuff we'd learned in class, started arguing about who was right. And, you know, we're arguing, you know, who knows what, you know, who's making the umbrellas for millennial rain, you know, stuff like that, you know. And that's, that's not real, so don't go try to look that up in the Bible. But we're arguing about this stuff, and we didn't realize that this guy we had been witnessing to for, for months was walking behind us. He was walking behind us, and we didn't notice him at first, and he's back there. And we got done with, uh, we had to walk for about a mile or two back to our car so we could get back and head back in town. And we're walking through there and didn't realize this lost man was right behind us. And we finished our walk, and I felt like I was throwing a couple really good verses at him and really showing him that I was so much smarter in the Bible than him. And we got to our cars, and this lost man, we turned around and looked, noticed he was right behind us. And he came up to us and he says, You know what, boys? I've been listening to what you guys have been having to say these last, you know, five, ten minutes. And you know what? I think you guys are involved in the most craziest stuff in the world. I don't think I want to hear any more about this Bible and this Jesus you tell me about. And we just slammed the door in that guy's face. You say, why was it? We put that light in a vessel. This old flesh. Look at me. Look at how much Bible I know. Look at how important I am. While this lost world doesn't get to see the light that it's supposed to see. That gets covered up in a vessel. That's the light that you should be shining. Now, also look there at verse uh, 16 in Luke chapter 8. He says... No man when he hath lighted the candle covereth it with a vessel or putteth it 
under a bed. Putteth it under a bed. You know what you ought not let do? Is you ought not let your comfort, your comfort, like a picture of that bed, dictate whether you put the light out or not. You know what, in this country we have, we have about the greatest blessing there is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. How, how many of you have suffered for being a Christian in this country? I, I can probably pretty certainly say nobody here has really truly suffered for being a Christian here. But you know what? This country is one of the worst ones for Christians to speak up for the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because they're worried about that bed of comfort they have. They don't want to disrupt people. They don't want to offend people. They don't want to upset them. You think about that. What would offend them worse? That you didn't say anything to them and just let them die and go to hell? Or maybe you hurt their feelings a little bit and told them they needed a Savior to save them from hell. What do you think they would rather hear? They'd rather hear and bow the name of Jesus Christ now? Or do you think you'd rather have them bow the name of Jesus in eternity? What do you think they'd rather hear? Well, obviously, they want to hear about it now. But you know what happens so many times? Our comfort, our comfort gets in the way. How many times has the Lord nudged you on the shoulder and say, Hey, why don't you go over there and witness to that guy? Why don't you go give him a track? And you say, well, the Lord, look at that guy. He looks like a freak. He looks like a maniac. If I go talk to him, he's going to get mad at me. And there's, You know what you're thinking about? You're thinking about your own comfort. And you're not being a light in this world. The Lord Jesus Christ called us to be a light in this world. Now you consider that. You consider that here in a coming and closing. If you go back to Matthew, go back to Matthew chapter 5, look there in verse 14. We don't want to end just with the negative part of that, but want to give you something to encourage you. Want to give you something to to bring you in mind, you know what, that God put a, a great blessing on you to be His representative, to be a light for Him, to shine forth for Him. And you know, that's a privilege. It's not a duty, it's not a chore. It's a privilege that God left, went back to heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ left and said, I want you to be my ambassador. I want you to be my ambassador in this world. And you know what, we get the, the greatest privilege of getting to see these lost souls come through time and you know what we get to see? We get to see them converted. We get to see them come who were once headed to hell, who once were in darkness, and that light shine in their life, and they become born again, they get a new life. And you know what? We get a small part in that. That's a great blessing when you consider that. So what do we say here in closing? We say, well, we get to take part of this punishment that gets averted. This punishment that gets averted. Not only does God have a position for you, He intended... And so many times in that position, we neglect our purpose. But you know what the greatest blessing is, is when you do what God wants you to do. There is nothing like it. There is, there is nothing to compare to watching and seeing a soul come and bow their knee and say, Lord, I want to trust you as my Savior. You can win the lottery. You can win $100 million, a $1 billion, whatever it is. You know what's going to happen in about 20 million years from now? That won't seem like nothing because you'll be walking on gold. All the riches and fame and popularity of this world won't compare to one soul. So you know what's going to be important to you? Did you have a part in seeing something take place in someone's life for eternity? Did you get to see that lost soul get saved? Did you have a part in that? Now, that's a great blessing. That's a punishment that gets averted. That's a punishment that the Lord allows you to step in so His mercy can prevail. That's a great blessing. I think about that. The, the first time I got to see somebody saved personally from my, my personal effect was when I was a young boy. I was a young boy. We were actually uh, out at our gym there in Bible Baptist Church. And we were out there and all the adults were in there. They were playing racquetball and hockey and things like that. And us kids went out there and there's one of the guys that was playing hockey he left from the rink early, and he was going to head back because he was a Navy man. And what had happened was some of those guys, those hockey players at church, invited him to come out and play hockey in hopes, you know, to get a, a chance to witness to him. And so this man, he comes out there, and, you know, he doesn't really do anything other than just play hockey and get ready to leave. And 
us kids see him, you know, going back to his car, and we got excited, so we run up there with, you know, a couple gospel tracts and things like that, and say, hey, here, let, let us give you this, and, you know, obviously he's curious, he's wanting to know what these kids are so excited about, and so he started asking us questions, and we thought, man, this, this is great, and so we start dealing with them, and I was about eight years old at the time, and started talking to him about the Lord, and talking to him about being saved, and he had never heard that before. He never knew what it was to be saved. And make a long story short with that, we got to deal with him there for about 30 minutes, and by the time we were done, he ended up bowing his head and trusting his Christ in the parking lot there. And I thought, man, this is the greatest thing in the world, you know? And you know what? I, I decided that he needs to be where we are. He needs to know just as much Bible. So I started from Genesis. I started with Adam and Eve. You know, I, got, I think I got maybe down to David killing Goliath, and about two hours later, he's like, sorry guys, I gotta, I gotta go, you know? But I was excited. I got to see a person change their eternity. And I had a small part in that. What did I have to do? Just let that light shine. Just shine it on a poor lost sinner. And you know what? They change from spending eternity in hell. Instead of that, they get to see their Savior one day in heaven. And you know what? There's nothing like that. There is nothing in comparison to that. You can't compare that to anything. That's the greatest thing you can do. There is no other higher privilege. You couldn't trade that for being the President of the United States. You couldn't trade that for anything. There is nothing in this world more important than that. So you know what? When we talk about this light, we talk about Jesus Christ saying, Ye are the light of the world. Ye are the light of the world. And the question to you as a Christian here today it's not that ye are becoming a light in this world. That's not what Jesus Christ said. Jesus Christ said emphatically, ye are. Ye are the light of this world, period. You're not training to become a light in this world. You already are. Now, you're either hiding that light, you're either concealing that light, or you're letting that light shine through. You're either covering it with your sin, or you're letting it shine through. You're either taking it off to a secret place, and concealing it from them, or you're shining it to this lost world. You're the only light this world has. It's not up to some magical thing from happening. It's up to you. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let your light so shine before men. That's what you're to do. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. That's the blessing of it. That city it's set on a hill... It can't be hid. It can't be concealed. And you know what? what's traveling out here in this ocean? In this ocean, there is some precious cargo. You say, well, how precious is this cargo? Do you guys love the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you love Him? What did He do? He died for something. He shed His blood. He gave His last drop of blood for something. What was that? One of the first verses I'm sure everybody learned. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. The very best was given for a cargo that's out there in life sea. It's getting knocked around in the tempest. And you know what they need to see? They need to see a light that can get them to safe harbor. They need to see a light that directs them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'm asking you here today, are you a light in this world? Or are you covering that light? Because you want your comfort. Or because your sin has gotten in the way. Or because your pride has gotten in the way. Jesus Christ says, ye are the light of the world. How good of a light are you? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to be here with these folks. Pray that the message would be a blessing to them. Be an encouragement to them. And the great privilege we have to be a light in this world. Lord, thank you for leaving it to us to do. Help us not to take it lightly. Help us to have true love for you and realize what you've done for us and this world on Calvary's Hill. Lord, help us to go out and spend our time telling others about you. Lord, we thank you for salvation. Thank you for what you did on Calvary. And Lord, I pray you'd give us the boldness to speak up to all those around us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.